In the pines, in the pines, where the sun never shines, you'll shiver when the cold wind blows. There's a grave in the pines, where the sun never shines, there's a grave that's shaded with the pines. Welcome back to The Land Between the Meadows. I'm your host, Mr. Cable, and we have a lot to talk about on another Kentucky History Podcast episode here. I hope that this podcast finds you in good health and that you're not going crazy with this coronavirus and this isolation and being quarantined all by ourselves and not being able to get out there and go. Now, as far as I know, and as far as the governor's restrictions go, you can still drive to some historic places. Just keep your social distance. Most likely, these places are not that full and don't have anybody there anyway. So if you're interested, go out and see some Kentucky history. It's all around us. Now, a few things to touch base with. Go over to YouTube and check out the Kentucky History Channel. We just posted our second video about Benjamin Lincoln and talks a bit more about Benjamin Lincoln and his effects on the nation and not just Kentucky. And goes into a little bit more depth than we have talked about him here on the podcast. Also, go over to Facebook and Twitter and check out our these newspaper clips. And I'll get into the newspaper a little bit more in a little bit. But on Facebook, I've been posting these clips of newspapers from Stanford, from the Interior Journal, from the Mount Vernon Signal, back in the 1800s and the early 1900s. Just some little informative kind of little bits of the newspaper, little clips, that, nothing too major. But you can find us on Facebook and Twitter at KY History Pod. So go check it out. I'm still working on a place to kind of put these, maybe the whole page article and so forth, but I've not figured that out yet. Hopefully, fingers crossed for maybe a possible website in the future. But also, I just completed our first author interview the other day, so I'm going to be editing it and putting it up. I'll probably put a podcast out about it, and I may even put a video on the on our YouTube channel as well. Some news here about our, our little Kentucky history community is that we're getting... A lot of good feedback from people who are listening, new listeners and so forth, and people reaching out to us for ideas and possible connections later on in the future, which is great. And we are now in 11 countries and 34 states. So that is really awesome considering how kind of new our podcast is. So let's keep keep sharing, sharing the post on Facebook and Twitter and wherever you're finding us. Let people know about us and so we can get more people to join up in our little, our little community here. But anyway, let's talk about Stanford, Kentucky. When we last left off, we kind of talked about basically Stanford from about 1770 up to about 1840, 1835. I think that might have been the last uh, year mentioned in our last podcast. But we've been talking about just different places and different things that are popping up in Stanford that have then carried Stanford throughout, well, throughout its existence. Some of these places are amazingly still open and still running today. So in 1850, there was a tavern in Stanford, and there's not a lot known about it. But what little I can say is that from a newspaper clipping that somebody had talked about being alive back then, it was called the Yates Tavern, and it was right behind the St. Asaph Hotel. And the fee to hit your horse was 30 cents a month. So that's that. Every town probably had a tavern, and I would really like to find out more about this tavern, but so far, no luck. I'm also quarantined, so I can't really research it too much. It would be nice, or that's the plan, to possibly go and research it a little more. That was in 1850, and I'm sure the Yates Tavern probably was around more than that. I'm sure it probably wasn't necessarily the only tavern around. I'm sure there was plenty of taverns to go around. Moving on to Stanford Baptist Church. It has a rich history. In November 1852, a group met to discuss a Baptist church in Stanford. In the following months, more meetings were held, and some leaders were elected and the church began meeting regularly in an alternate building until their own building was built in 1859. Now, two more structures were then built throughout the years, and additions were added on, but the same congregation still meets to this day, which is, again, amazing how long some of these, some of these places have been and how much history they have just within themselves. As we move on, 
the town of Stanford is well established. We have courthouses, we have churches, we have schools, we have a jail and a tavern. What else do we need in a town? Of course, a bank. Now the bank history of Stanford can be a little confusing when you look at this bank, this bank, this bank, this bank, because here's how it goes. Let's just hop into it. The first bank in Stanford in 1854 was the Deposit Bank of Stanford and was originally established in 1854. And then it became the National Bank of Stanford in 1865. In 1882, it became the first National Bank of Stanford. And this was basically needed because the railroad came in. And the railroad, you know, brought in a lot of money. Now, the Lincoln County National Bank came along in 1883. And then this, <laughs> and this bank eventually absorbed Crab Orchard Bank, McKinney Bank. And then all the banks ended up being, and, and of course not all the banks, but all these banks, the, the Deposit Bank of Stanford, which became the National Bank of Stanford, which became the first National Bank of Stanford, and then the Lincoln County National Bank all ended up merging together to form the first Southern National Bank in 1983. So that's a lot. <laughs> and if I'm getting this right, I think I am. The Lincoln County National Bank and the first National Bank of Stanford formed together because the Lincoln County National Bank was formed in 1883, so it was around for 100 years before it consolidated. But the Stanford Bank, that was the, the, that was the deposit bank of Stanford, was the one that became the first national bank of Stanford. Anyway, there's banks. There's a lot of interesting stuff about banks, I'm sure. But all those banks end up liquidating themselves and all this and that, and it gets real murky. Now, here's a business that we all have connections to and that we can all relate to. The first newspaper was founded in the late 1850s under the name of the Stanford Banner. Now, this newspaper was founded by Mr. Campbell and an associate, which we don't really know much about. That's really it. I was able to find two papers from the Banner in 1868, and that's it. They were very informative of the time period and really need, really need to read, but they're also very hard to read because of they're so old. But um, again, I'm working on a... I'm trying to work on a way that I can post these papers to Facebook or something that you can read them. Because if I just take a picture of them, if I just take a screenshot and post that screenshot of an entire paper, you're not going to be able to read it. So I'm trying to figure out a way that I can post it and you can maybe download it or something so that you can see these old papers written in 1868. I mean, it's pretty interesting and it's pretty cool. But, you know, I'll... I'm already doing the digging, so I don't see why you need to go do the digging as well. I'm trying to cut out the cut out the legwork for you, so I can just post it out there and say, hey, this is, a, this is one of the papers. It's really you know, interesting. Check this out. It's easy to post little clips because the little clips are easier to read. It's harder to post a whole PDF of a paper from 1868 because then you can't, if you can't zoom in and look at it and it's not clear... It's hard to see or read. Now, anyway, back to the back to the paper. That was pretty much it for the banner. W.P. Walton came into town and bought the paper and renamed it the Interior Journal in the 1870s. Over the years, Walton, or W.P. as he was known, was very honest, stubborn, and true to Lincoln County and Stanford. He wrote about controversial issues such as gun control and even the local county gangs, which he helped run off. Now, I'll bring up these two things because they both come together in this little story that is uncovered here. He basically called everybody out and said that anybody who's packing around a gun is a coward, which you think this was the 1870s, 1880s. That's a huge statement. Even today, if you were to say, hey, nobody needs a gun. But his basis was simple, I assume, that you shouldn't need to have a gun to settle your disputes or settle your issues. If you're packing around a gun, you're going to scare everybody to your way or, or however, you, however you may look at it. The point I want to make here is he was told in many parts of the county not to even go into those parts. And on one occasion, he actually decided that he would take a gun and he took his pistol into this part of the county that he was not supposed to go into. Nothing big happened. He got out of there fine. But from that day on, he never packed a gun again, which is very interesting. You don't want to categorize the town or the 1880s or during this time period as like the Wild West. But I guess it could get pretty rough really quick and you throw some guns in there, things could get messy. He also did not hold back against politicians. And I want to actually read an excerpt from one of his writings from the paper. This writing was criticizing Governor Luke Blackburn of Kentucky on the eve of his election in 1883. 
what the bed bug is to a tired and sleepy traveler, what the chicken cholera is to a poultry yard, what a boil is on the end of one's nose, what the summer complaint is to children, that is what Mr. is to our country politics, an annual recurring course of petty irritation, annoyance, and worry. Let us be thankful, therefore, that on next Monday, the great reformer once more will be disposed of for this year. Not long, however, time the next crop of caterpillars begin to drop, begin to drop from the trees down our necks. We may look for Mr. again, for by that time it will have again become the patriot's duty to do battle for the sacred rights of the poor man and to strike the lightning of the righteous indignation, the man who wears a clean shirt. And now this was directed towards, again, the governor of Kentucky, Luke Blackburn. And to remind you, and I've said this before, the newspaper was basically the local gossip column as well. Some of the newspaper clips I found and I posted them on Facebook are from the Interior Journal. They're very, quite entertaining and they, they tell a lot. Now, in most small towns, especially around the late 1800s, early 1900s, and into the 1940s and 50s even, changed. And they changed for one big reason. The railroad. And crowds gathered when the first iron horse rolled into Stanford in 1866 on the new Louisville and Nashville track. It was built in 1865 and used for freight and passenger trains. And this is where the Stanford Depot got its start. The second depot was actually built in 1881, where the current one stands. However, it was torn down, and the structure that stands there today was built in 1912. So still, the structure that stands there today is over 100 years old. Very, very cool. Now, this depot was described as one of the nicest depots between Louisville and Knoxville. It had three waiting rooms, one for women, one for general, and one for African Americans. The last passenger train was in 1958, and in 1987 was the last freight train that came through. Now, when I see a lot of towns, the small towns, and I think of what they used to be, and kind of what happened. And I think my opinion, or the theory I kind of hold to, is that the trains is what happened. When the trains came, new people came, things were going on, things were built, things were put in place because people would come to the town, stay for the night or the day or a few days, and then they would leave on the next train, however it may have been. And that opportunity built up movie theaters or the downtown scene, and that's kind of what you see through towns. You think of Stanford, Crowbush, Broadhead, Mount Vernon, Livingston, and on and on and on. Those towns were all connected by the trains. Now, once cars and planes became more relevant and the trains went away, those forms of entertainment, they went away as well. And that's kind of one thing that I guess has been lost and that kind of went away with the trains. However, I don't want to say it. I do, I would like to know. I do, I'm more interested in trains in general, just the railroads and how, who funded them? Was it Louis, the city of Louisville and Nashville? I know I've read a few things where it talked about the city of Cincinnati being the first city, I think, to uh, sponsor a train, but it's just a curiosity of mine, and maybe some maybe some listeners know a little bit more about trains or could, could point me into the direction of like just train history in general, which sounds so nerdy, but that's okay. One thing I bet you're probably not expecting me to talk about from Stanford is the Stanford Cheese Factory. <laughs> or the Stanford Creamery. It was founded in the late 1800s by some Swiss settlers, and they would make the cheese, they would go around and actually sell it. Uh, the cheese plant was actually lo located near Blue Lick. And I just wanna read some of these names, or I guess I should say this, I wanna try to read some of these names because they get a bit tongue-tied or a bit different. So there's Gander, Kaminish, Von Grugen, Reichenbach, Sumi, I don't know about that one, S-U-M-I, Zerberg, Schosfer, Palmer, oh, Oler, and Otter. Now, Chris Otter sold cheese in Stanford, hauling it in a wagon, which all, a lot of this, this cheese factory was main, maintained and supported by the local, local farmers. The creamery was located on Houston Road, just beyond Buffalo Springs. So with the demand of dairy picking up, the Stanford Creamery was founded by local farmers. The Stanford Creamery existed under the management of these local farmers until about 1920s when it was sold to some business people from Cincinnati. In 1912, this is just an interesting fact that Stanford overwhelmingly voted to be a dry town. The next store I want to talk about is the Coleman's Drug Store, which was actually previously owned or known as Penny's Drug Store. But in 1916, Mr. E.R. Coleman 
purchased it after graduating from Louisville College of Pharmacy. And he actually found a few interesting receipts from 1881. So obviously the Penny's Drugstore was probably operating for a while, at least 20, 30 years before he took it over. So there's a drugstore in Stanford for a while. Now the real story took place in 1917. Steve Bauman defeated Ed Hubbard for sheriff. So what does Ed do? He shoots Bauman in the back of the head. Probably thinking, what? Huh? <laughs> what does this have to do with the drugstore? What well, happened while Bauman was walking into the drugstore? Interestingly enough, Smith was tried and banished from Lincoln County. He was never allowed to set foot in it again. Now, the Coleman store, <laughs> the Coleman's drugstore is still open today. Interesting. A quick person I want to mention here from Stanford, and I will, of course, we probably have to talk about him a little more later because there's a I don't have as much information and I would like to learn a bit more about him, but it's Lieutenant Richard Coswell Safely, who was one of the first Navy aviation pilots. And you may or may not know, but the Navy aviation eventually became the U.S. Air Force. And Lieutenant Safely was one of the first, uh, one of the first pilots who tested many different aircrafts. He was really critical about an aircraft that wasn't really up to standards. And he eventually died test flying one of these. Very interesting and well-known person from Stanford, well, I, you may not know him now, but he influenced a lot in the Navy aviation program. And I'll kind of do a little more research when I can to kind of get a bit more about him. Very interesting person who came from Stanford that people probably don't know about nowadays. But keeping with the growth of Stanford and the railroad coming in and businesses picking up and the need for more commercial goods, James M. Phillips comes to Stanford, and in 1905, he builds the building on the corner of Main and Logan Street. He was a pioneer in making blocks, stone blocks, concrete blocks, I should say. The building that he built was the first concrete building in Stanford, and he had the bricks shipped in from England in a wooden barrel. Now, that's a lot of bricks and probably a lot of barrels. But his brother, Henry Phillips, arrives, and the brothers open up at Rock Quarry, and they begin making concrete blocks. And over time, the two brothers, they received patents and they're very big entrepreneurs in the Lincoln County, Stanford area. The original building that James Phillips built was actually a grocery store on the first floor and on the top, school, the top floor was a skating rink, which I found very unique. I mean, get your groceries, go skate around up top. You probably wouldn't find that today anywhere. And then of course, another aspect comes in with all these build buildings kind of getting going, all this uh, growth, you could call it. The Lincoln Lumber Company begins in 1918 and was founded by Joseph Franklin Pettus, P-E-T-T-U-S. He rented the building from the Phillips Brothers, and it closed in 1983. And the Lincoln Lumber Company actually built Waynesburg High School. The building was located on the east side of Lancaster Street. Now, Stanford is really booming now. We're getting commercial goods, schools, you name it, railroad. We're getting all the uh, paper. We're getting all these necessities of a town, so we need a hospital. And Lincoln County Memorial Hospital opened in 1926 on Main Street in Stanford. And in charge, placed in charge of this hospital was Miss Kissling, a graduate nurse from Louisville. Now, I found a very interesting excerpt saying that the past that the executives of the hospital told the public, now don't be getting too excited. This doesn't mean that a hospital is gonna be open past April which is mind-boggling to think that they were, seemed like they were running the hospital or paying the hospital bills month to month, or at least every few months, and they were really relying on donations. And now, I want to stop right here for this part of Stanford's history, because there's a whole lot of, there's more stuff we can talk about in the 50s and the 60s and, and on and on and on, but I don't really want to venture too far into the, what you could call the modern day the modern times or however you want to define it because I want to be I want to be able to go and talk to some people who lived during those times there's people that are alive that lived in the 50s and the, and the 40s and even some that are in the 30s and I would much rather go and talk to them and get a first-hand account on what it was like living in Stanford during those times and the hope is once this quarantine kind of is lifted off and we're able to get back out that I can get in touch with some of these people and talk to them and get this, those old stories. So I'm kind of finishing off here during the 1926, during the opening of the hospital, because there's other things. Of course, there's many other things. And of course, I want to talk about the radio stations, uh, Walton's Opera House, which I want to get more information about Walton's Opera House. The information I have here is just not enough to talk about it. And it seems like a very important uh, staple in the 
Stanford scene during the 1900s. So I want to get into that. And of course, the Lincoln County oral history is, is out there and the library has many of these oral histories that that's kind of what I want to get to. I want to get to those because I can get these oral histories and these are people that have talked about Lincoln County and are living in Stanford during those times. They can give us firsthand accounts. To me, that's much better than me rattling off all these history dates and this and that. Now, some of the stories are very interesting, but it's just, and I'll, I'll, I'll enjoy doing the research and kind of connecting the dots. The first-hand account is, of course, going to be so much more better. And so once this is lifted out, I'll, I'll work on getting those and putting those together. And that's kind of how the county histories and these local histories are going. I, I'll get it up to a point of about 1930, 1940 at the latest, and then we'll try to connect the dots with just the actual people who were there. With all that being said, I want to throw out a quick reminder. Share us on Facebook and Twitter as much as you can. And you can find us at KY History Pod on either of those platforms. Give us a good rating on iTunes if you can. It takes no time at all. From what I understand, the more ratings, the more positive ratings you have, the higher you get in the list of Apple Podcasts, and the more likely your podcast is going to be shared when people search for it, or when, when people search for podcasts. So that would be good. The more listeners, the better. The more people who can feed into our podcast and our little, and, and provide us with information. Because here's how, because at this moment, I got Lincoln County and Rockcastle pretty well covered. But I'm going to have to start really pulling out some strings to people in other counties. And we've had some people already reach out and say, hey, I can help you with this county and that county. But there's 120 counties in this state. Or each county is a huge city. Louisville and Fayette County are going to be massive undertakings when we start looking at the history of those two places. Also, as we got this county-by-county county history going on, let us know what county you're from. Just post a comment on Facebook. I'm here from this county. I'm here from that county. Because eventually, we're going to get to every county. So there's a lot of Kentucky history out there. And on top of that, we now have the Kentucky History Channel on YouTube you can subscribe to. Check it out. Give us a thumbs up on it. Subscribe to it as well. And you can just get all the Kentucky content you want. I also throw it out again. Check out Family Tree Nuts. So you can find them on Facebook and on YouTube. A lot of great videos on-site places in Kentucky about historical places. You really need to check it out. It's really good. They put out many videos, sometimes three or four a day on-site on historical sites in Kentucky. Tell them Mr. Cable sent you. I, I'll say it again, get all the Kentucky history you can get. Hopefully we get out of this quarantine soon and that me and Mr. Pope are able to get back out and get back onto our normal track on Kentucky history. Hope you're enjoying these county by county ones and there's more to come. With all that being said, I'll finally wrap it up again that we're in this together, Kentucky, and we're all part of Team Kentucky. So I hope that wherever you are, that the curve is fighting for you. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time.